Hey everyone, welcome back to some new tales from the call center. I hope you had a great day. The first story is called $2.23. This was one of those calls where you both feel the same way for opposing reasons. It began in early December. I was calling a customer who has paid the bill on time the past few months. But he has owed us $2.23 for months now due to many previous months of paying us random sums whenever the spirit moved him and always leaving a balance. Yes, it is only $2.23, hardly worth shutting someone off for. We are a small local ISP. Yes, I have spent more than $2.23 on paper, ink and postage the past few months sending past due notices to the customer. Yes, it is totally ridiculous. But when I talked to the owner about it, he made a really important point. He pointed out that combined, all those people owe quite a sum, so go forth and collect it. And he has a point. It is only $2.23, so just pay it and be done with it. The customer though thinks we should just write it off, cause it's only $2.23. He won't charge it to the card on file, because it costs as much as a charge. I think that means he has a debit card that charges him a fee for transactions, or maybe after so many transactions, because he charges his bill automatically every month. Or maybe he's making it up, doesn't really matter. I cannot add the $2.23 to next month's payments, the system won't allow it. It will charge it as a separate $2.23 which he refused to do. He can't send a check, he has no checks and the bank would charge him to send a check on his behalf through online payments. Money orders cost as much as the $2.23 so they are out as well. So can't I just write it off, it's only $2.23. I could suggest taking him off auto pay for a month and him getting the bank to send us one check for the monthly fee plus the $2.23. But given his past payment history, I don't trust him to make that payment. He gets hostile and eventually by mid-December friends to send $2.23 in pennies because that will show you. I have no idea how much postage would be for something like that, but I am guessing it would be close to that amount. No pennies arrived, no cash at all arrived. Two weeks pass. Then, a few days later, he calls back because his bill day was the first and he got one of our pay up or be cut off notices that go out automatically. He mailed us $2.23 in cash weeks ago. Weeks. What do you mean you never received it? One of you must have stolen it. Sure buddy, we took your $2.23 and got a super big gulp for all eight of us to share. He demands credit for the money he mailed in because it's hardly his fault if we didn't get it or someone stole it. Can't I just write it off? No, I can't. But it's only $2.23. Yes, it is only $2.23, so why not just pay it? This went back and forth until I said, sorry, but we've reached a disconnect point. Suddenly he knows the owner. The owner will be furious to hear I shut someone off for $2.23. First, everyone knows the owner. He's won some kind of telecommunications business in this town since 1986 and hardly anyone hasn't been a customer of his at some point. Second, because everyone knows the owner, no one gets perks for it. If he wants something done specially for a customer, he initiates it. We get into zero trouble for not following through on, but the owner said if there are no notes. Third, my calling the customer was totally the owner's idea. So I went with the company line. Well sir, he might be, but I would need to hear that from him. In these types of situations, he prefers you call him directly and then he'll call me. So transfer me to him. Oh, he's not in the office right now, but give him a call on his cell, he always has it on him. Give me the number, I don't have it with me. Sorry, we have orders not to give that out. Obscenities ensue, so I hang up and big surprise, I hear nothing from the boss. So I shut off the customer, over only $2.23. The furious customer shows up the morning after and throws two $1 bills and a quarter at the billing person and demands change. We aren't that kind of place. We don't keep cash on hand as people don't generally come in with it, or at all really. So we didn't have two cents to give him, so after much, overly dramatic if you ask me searching of pockets and wallets, we did eventually find two pennies. His parting comment? I don't know how you people stay in business if you cut people off for $2.23 instead of just writing it off. 
Sorry, but I find it inconvenient to pay you is not a reason to write off a debt. Even if it is only $2.23. The next story is called Bad Idea for the First Day on a New Job. I used to work in a customer care department for a mobile company and that place had some seriously wild turnover rates. I lasted a little over a year and by that time I think only one other person hired in the same group as me was still employed there. However, my favorite tale from that center involved a new hire about six months into my stint there. She had just finished training and was under probation on the team on the other side of the cubicle wall from me. So I could kind of hear her talking on the phone. She seemed to be doing okay. But I thought she might have some kind of speech impediment as she was slurring her words a little bit. No big deal, it happens, but she was coherent, so who cares, right? Boy was I wrong, an in for a treat. It went downhill fast after the lunch hour. Apparently, the new hire had gone across the street to the male waiter version of Futos and got absolutely smashed. She came back and I could smell the booze from the other side of the cubicle. And based on the slurring, it had me realize that she had probably been drinking all day as she had been slurring since she had come in. I waved my supervisor over, let him know what was going on from what I could smell and hear and he headed over to talk to the supervisor for her team. There was a bit of muffled discussion on the other side of the wall and then, suddenly, all hell broke loose. As when she was effectively fired by her supervisor. I found out later that he had first told her to go home and be suspended, but she refused and insisted that she was fine. She lost her mind and started trying to assault the supervisor and threw something at the computer and busted the monitor. It took three of the security guys from the building to restrain her and move her away from the floor and the police were obviously called. She breaks down in hysterics, I can't lose this job, please give me another chance, at the top of her lungs and you could hear it even though she was outside the room. I felt bad obviously, as alcoholism is a problem, but you can't exactly expect to get hammered and then keep your job in a customer facing role. The third story is called Bank Scam. So as I work for a bank, I get a lot of scam calls. I got told if I give them 500 pounds, they start my modeling career. I thought this was a deposit for a flat rental. That sort of thing. But I got one today that was different. An old woman comes through, voice shaking. She tells me I got a call from a broadband company saying that foreign hackers had compromised my IP address to hack my computer. To fix that, I have to download this program. So at this point I'm thinking, I see where this is going, remote access scam. But no. So, of course, she installed it and logged into her digital banking. But instead of accessing it, they took a screenshot. And when they tried to bill her for the services, they apparently accidentally deposited £20,000 into her account. They edited the screenshot to make it look like this had happened and emailed it to her. They then told her she's liable to pay some kind of tax on it or face jail time, but not to worry. They have a safe deposit account she can hide it in. And the best part is she only has to give £14,000 back. I think you can see where this is going. So they instructed her not to tell the bank what this is for, as we would call the police on her. So into our branch she goes and sends off the full £14,000 with the story that it's for her granddaughter's wedding. Now she's on the phone with me and she says to me in a shaky voice, I have been so worried, I can't handle the guilt, am I going to prison for this? At this point it clicked. She didn't know there was no £20,000 deposit. This poor woman has been scammed out of £14,000 and she has absolutely no idea. And now I have to break the news to her. How on earth do you do that? I had to tell this poor woman that there was no deposit and that was £14,000 of her own money she sent off. And let me tell you, I have never heard a human being make those noises in my life. I have never heard such a deep, hurt wailing come out of someone. I started to tear up at this point as I had to tell her all I can do is call fraud and see what they can do. Now this is where things get better. The advisor in the branch smelled a red and pended the payment in such a way that it looked like it had gone but it didn't actually. So the payment was declined and she got it back thankfully. I had never been so relieved in all my days. She cried even harder when I gave her the good news. The last story is called, you shouldn't do that with a call center. About a decade ago, I was working in customer service for a large cell phone company. 
My specific assignment was handling customer complaints, either as letters or as complaints lodged with first tier customer service. I had a case of a guy who said he had thousands of dollars of fraudulent international roaming on his account. Okay, that's serious, so I look at his account. Sure enough, his last phone bill was for about $5,000, of which most of that was international roaming. Well, I look closer. The roaming is on all the lines on the account. Then, looking at the call histories, there are calls from the Los Angeles area. Then there was a gap of a few hours. Then calls from the Miami area. And then, a few hours later, international roaming begins with cruise ship roaming. So the more I dig into it, it's clear the guy took his whole family on a Caribbean cruise. They found out that they had phone signals on the cruise ship, which counts as international roaming and phone signal on every island that they went to, also international roaming. And they were constantly talking on the phones the whole time. Well, I can't take that charge off the bill. The most I could do would be to give $500 off as a courtesy. But only if he acknowledged that he was wrong and I explained to him the nature of international roaming and his phone plan and he understood it. Well, I called the guy. When I tried to break it to him as politely and professionally as I could that I cannot take those charges off the bill, he starts raising his voice at me. He was screaming, blustering, talking about how rich and powerful and important he is and how I better take the charge off the bill if I know what's good for me. Well, that wasn't going to make me change my mind. He then pauses for a moment, stammers, I'm having a heart attack and hangs up. I immediately told my supervisor. He tells me to call 911 and direct emergency services to the customer while he tries to contact the customer. I call 911 from my workstation, which sets off an alarm in the call center. Everyone knows I'm on an emergency call. In less than a minute, every supervisor and manager there is crowded around our area and has learned what's going on. I get the local 911, I explain what's going on and they patch me to the 911 in Bakersfield. I explain the situation and I'm on the line with them while my supervisor is calling every number on the customer's account to get to him. He tries calling the customer back. No answer. He calls the other phone lines on the account and gets the customer's wife and three kids. He tells them what's going on and that we are trying to see if this man is okay. His wife says she's leaving work now to go home and check on him. His kids are all old enough to drive and they all say they are leaving whatever they are doing to go home and check on their dad. I want this time I get off the line with 911. My boss is putting the calls he's making on speakerphone for everyone around to hear. He gets to the last number on the account, the landline. This is usually vestigial, most landline numbers on accounts were obviously out of use. But he was checking to be sure. He calls the number and the customer picks up on the other end. My boss introduces himself and the customer goes ballistic, saying he didn't want to talk to us. Apparently he refused to pick up when we called back because he said he was too angry at us to talk to us. Well, my boss let him know that we had called 911 because he had reported to us that he was having a heart attack. The guy said that he wasn't having a heart attack, he was just saying that to make it clear how much we were upsetting him by not taking those phony charges off the bill. At about this moment you can hear a siren in the background and the customer is asking what's going on. There's a pounding on the customer's door that can be heard over the phone. My boss explains that we have contacted 911 since he reported he was having a medical emergency and we couldn't reach him. There's louder pounding on the customer's door and we can hear someone shouting in the distance. The customer goes ballistic, saying that if he has to pay anything for this ambulance call, he'll sue us. He shouts about how he'll have us fired, he'll sue our company and us personally, and how when it's over he'll own our whole company and have us all thrown in jail. And then he hangs up. Needless to say, we never heard another word from the guy or about this incident. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please don't forget to click the like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. Let me know what you think about this episode in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.